Welcome back into our class, BI 250, the book of Job. BI 250, the book of Job. We'll continue in our study here in the book of Job, which is a very powerful, ample, profound book, which is very applicable today. We're going to continue our study in Job chapter 1, and let's go back to the first five verses, and because we're talking about that all of a sudden, Job's way of life, it was, it was interrupted by this satanic attack, and then this relentless, horrible suffering that consumed his life. Amen? And many of us can relate to that. Amen? So let's go back and see what the principles are here. In Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, remember I'm teaching out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible, depending on what version you have. And many of you have different language Bibles around the world, so that's okay. Just follow along with me. Let's pick this up. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. It says, seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and, and very many servants, and that, the man was the, and, and that man was the greatest of all men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of feasting had completed, the cycle Job would send and, and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continue. Now, I don't, I don't know if you realize this, but he's got seven sons and three daughters, right? which meant that he had 10 burnt offerings that he was offering on behalf of his family. This man loved his children. But he also understood the heart of man. He understood that man the more, had more than the possibility of, and that was cursing God, blaspheming God, disrespecting God in all kinds of manner. And so he was a blameless man, a man who stood up. Look what he says here. Um, in, in verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and Job, and that man was blameless. Now, well, I want to paint the picture of Job purposely, because a lot of people are complaining. It's just not right. It's just not right. It's just not right. It's not right that this is happening to me. This, 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 this. Well, I understand those sentiments, and I understand those feelings, and I'm not about to get in an argument with you about those feelings. But he was a man who God, personally, God said he was blameless. And yet, as the old vernacular says, all hell broke loose on his life. Job presents a powerful example of godliness. A clear picture of a man who sought to honor the Lord in and, and, and all that he did. Although he was blameless and upright, he was human. And because he was human, he was open to the attack of Satan. Therefore, Job was not perfect. He was not sinless. Nevertheless, it is clear that Job lived a righteous and a holy life, for the Lord himself declared that Job was blameless. Again, look what he says in Job chapter 1, verse 8. Verse 8, he says, And the Lord said unto Satan, He's talking to Satan. And he says, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth. And turning away, he says, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. Job feared God. Job revered God. Job loved God. Job proved this in the day-by-day -day behavior okay, of his life. He could have spoiled his children with his excessive wealth, but there is no indication that he did so. Rather, he set a godly example for them. What better example of concern he could show for God's holy name, and that was to offer atoning sacrifices in the event of his children had sinned. Isn't that amazing? He took the time. He loved God so much, and he loved his children so much that he wanted to make sure that 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 the that the that the that the roads uh, and the uh, communication would open all the time between him and God and his children and his children and God. And by this one single act, 
Job showed how highly he esteemed and he feared the Lord. Job set a dy- Job set a dynamic example for us. We too must fear and revere the Lord. We must honor and respect the Lord in His holy name. How many of us are just so nonchalant about the lives of our children? Now we say we love the Lord. We love the Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. We serve the Lord. Okay? But we don't intercede on behalf of our children enough before the Lord like Job did. God's word. Listen to me carefully. God's word changes us. It changes us to fear and honor the Lord time and time and time and time and again. If we fear the Lord, then we follow him, obey his commandments, and faithfully worship him. That's exactly what Job did. Let me give you an example of this. Hold your place in Matthew, I mean, I'm sorry, hold your place in Job and go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, please. He says, and do not be afraid of those who kill, he says, who kill the body. This is Jesus speaking. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is it, exactly, who is it that you fear? You fear your neighbors more? Your family more, your friends more, your acquaintances more, your colleagues at work more, the people in the street. You got you fear everybody except God of what they might think if you actually love and honor God. Buddy, let me explain something to you, okay? You're gonna you're gonna have to face you're gonna have to face some issues between you and God which you cannot escape. Let, let's just develop this for a little bit. Go back to the Old Testament and go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I want you to see this in verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 29. If only they had such a heart in them. Look at this. To fear fear me and keep all my commandments. Listen, this is God talking. If only they had such a heart in them, like Job. To fear me and keep all my commandments always so that it will go well with them and with their sons forever. It's what God desires, folks. In that same book of Deuteronomy, go to chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and look what he says in verse 2. Verse 2. So that you, your son, and your and your grandson, so that you, your son, and your grandson will fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes, and he says, and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Stay with me. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And Deuteronomy chapter 10, Deuteronomy chapter 10, look at what he says in verse 12. Verse 12. He says, And now, Israel, he says, What does the Lord your God require of you? What does he require of you? What does he require of us? He says, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him and to serve the Lord, he says, with your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Is that where you and I are? Or is that not where we should be? That's where we should be. Listen to the words of the wise man in the book of Psalm chapter 29. In Psalm chapter 29, verse 2. Psalm 29, verse 2. He says, ascribe unto the Lord. He says, the glory that is due his name. Ascribe unto the Lord the glory that is due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Go back with me. I want to go back back to Job chapter 1. I want to just beat this dead horse down. Okay, this horse is dead, and I'm coming, and we're just beating him down. Okay, I want you to see this with me because I want to talk to you about the champion of character and consistency. The champion of character and consistency, which yes, you can achieve if you would surrender yourself completely unto the fear of the Lord. And I want you to see this with me in the book of Job, chapter one, verse five. I want you to look at now in this particular section, we immediately glean Job's character and Job's wealth. Now, usually those two things don't go together. Okay? Usually don't go together. But we see this in Job's life. We see this in Job's life, okay? We see his character and we see his wealth, okay? And I want to develop this idea that Job, had, he was a champion of character and, but more importantly, of consistency in that character. 
You know, there's one of the few people that I know on this blessed earth, okay? Very dear, precious, precious friend of mine, Dr. Gary Fleetwood. And Brother Gary Fleetwood is, a, <clears throat> um, in my estimate, he's a, he's a great brother in the Lord. He's a great pastor, okay? And, but he's a great believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I see in his life is, just like Job, he's a champion of character and consistency. A champion of character and consistency. And I want you to see this with me. Because typically in the lives of many people, you don't see character and wealth go together. Go back. Job chapter 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Verse 2. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and he says, and very many servants, and that man was the greatest of all the men of the, uh, uh, of all the, men of the East. And he said, his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house for each one in his day, and they would send word and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. In verse 5, and when the days of the feasting had completed this cycle, Job would send word to them and consecrate them, getting up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And Job did so continually. When you see a father, and you see a mother who's constantly bowing their knees, bowing their hearts, bowing their person to God and interceding on behalf of their children. These are grown children. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're so in love with God. They so revere God, fear God, love God as they love their children. And many, many a person proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy person? Did you hear me? Many of us will claim our own loyalty, but who can find a truly trustworthy person? King Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 6, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, he says, Many a person proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy person? And in this book, in the book of Job, an answer to this question is provided for all of us in the person of Job. And the Lord basically says to us in this ancient book, okay, that has survived the following sands of time for over 400 millenniums. And Job, let me par let me put it in the in the street vernacular, if you will. If you want to see what a faithful man is like, then I'll show you one who was genuine. Let me introduce you to my buddy Job. If I can put it in the street vernacular, that's how God would have said it, right? In the first five verses, in this very um, how would I say, in this very difficult book, okay, are like a soak are like a soak sponge dripping with life-changing principles and waiting to be squeezed. There is much to drink from these verses, okay? And we're going to take our time. And now, uh, my brother my brother Gary will tell you, he says, I'm never in a hurry and I never finish. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I have to kind of laugh and go, because it's true. He, he, he knows me, okay? He knows me, right? right? He says, so we're going to take our time to try to fill out, uh, to fill out what, I, what they contain, okay? And I wanted you to see this because, you know, I, I, my frustration is that we tend to read the Bible and we read it like it, as if it was some kind of a newspaper, you know. We just quickly go, we scan through the articles and we just move on, throw that away and, and go tomorrow and buy the next newspaper and so forth, right? Okay? Or you need to slow down. You need to savor what is actually being said here. And I remember as a child. I, I, I would sell newspapers early in the morning before 6 o'clock in the morning. I would go sell newspapers at the train station, right? And then in the afternoon, okay, we had the afternoon paper, okay, and we would go sell that, okay. But the point is, is that, and it, but it, but it was just, it, it was, it was just turning over and over and over again, and we got accustomed to doing that. You need to stop, slow, smell the coffee, savor what is actually being said in these verses. So let's go back to Job one one, and I want to talk to you about, and I want to look at briefly with you about his integrity. His integrity. It says here in Job 1.1, 1, 1, he says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. 
Now, our story here begins with a man named Job, okay, that lived in the land of Uz. Now, Job, uh, Job is not a figment of someone's imagination or part of a fairy tale, okay? He was a real person. And how do I know that? Because James talked about Job in the New Testament, holding, over, holding him up as an example of patience, right? Now, go with me. Hold your place in Job 1, 1. And go to James chapter 5, verse 11. James chapter 5, verse 11. And he says, we count those who, he says, we count those blessed who endured. This is James 5, 11. He says, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job. Have you heard of the patience of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful? In fact, in the Old Testament, go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And Ezekiel referred to Job too, pointing out his righteousness. Now, that's really an amazing thing to me that you can go all the way to the book of James and James mentions Job. Okay? He talks about Job. Approximately... Two million years later, you know, two thousand years later, more or less, okay. And now, if we're gonna, if we're gonna forward the clock to us, it's about four thousand plus years, okay. But I want you to see this. James mentions him, and then the prophet Ezekiel recognizes the righteousness of Job in the book of Job, chapter fourteen, verse fourteen. Job fourteen fourteen says this: Even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in the midst, were in its midst. By their own righteousness. Think about this for a moment with me. The Bible upholds that Noah, Daniel, and Job were men who could walk in their own righteousness. And it says they were in the midst of by their own righteousness. They could only save themselves, declares the Lord Jesus, the Lord God. Okay. Now, stay with me. We'll talk about the integrity of Job. Now they're the only three, the only three that I know of that are mentioned outright, okay, that can walk in their own righteousness and save themselves. And that's Noah, Daniel, and Job. Ezekiel recognizes that. Now stay with me in Ezekiel chapter 14 and look at verse 20. You go down there with me to verse 20. And Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20 says, Even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it were in his midst as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not save either their son or their daughter. They were saved only themselves by their righteousness. Wow. That's amazing to me. They were saved only themselves by their own righteousness. By their righteousness. That, that's... Uh, let me tell you something. That, that explodes in my head. Look. Job lived in the land of Uz. Not the land of Oz. Not Oz as in the Wizard of Oz, but in the land of Uz. So where is that? Where is where is the land of Uz? I think that's a good question, right? I was teaching through this, and I, you know, and I get all these text messages from all the pastors, and I'm teaching this series uh, with a lot of pastors in Africa in, in said eleven different countries that come together, and um, and, and so people ask, so where is the land of Uz? Uh, that's a really good question, okay? Mm -hmm. And why is that a good question? Because if the land of Uz never existed, then Job never existed. Mm -hmm. Well. In the Bible days, in the days of the Bible, right, many times the, land, the, the name of a land was based on a person, okay? So that custom was not any different than what we do in our own country when we name a city or a person or a street after them, okay? It's very possible, it's very possible, okay, that this land was named after the great grandson of Shem, of Shem, okay, remember him? Now, I'm not saying that definitively, but it's a possibility. Let, let me show you. Turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. And go down with me down to verse 3. Verse 3. And it says, The sons of Aaron were, were, were Uz. Who? Geth, Geth, okay, and Mash. Okay. Now, we don't know it. We, now, I, Listen, we do not know its exact location. What location? The land of Uz, okay? But uh, but Bible scholars, there's a Bible scholar who, uh, um, I mean, when I was in seminary, uh, Arno Gabellian, okay, um, believed that the land of Uz was east of Palestine and probably part of Udema, okay? Or in close proximity to the land of Edom, okay? 
In fact, it could have been part of Edom, okay, as, as we know. Okay? Now, this would put this land in the southern part of Israel in the Dead Sea region. That's, that's where it would be put, okay? Now, this location seems to be confirmed, seems to be, by Jeremiah, by Jeremiah when he wrote in the book of Lamentations. Let me show you this. Open your Bible to the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 21. Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 21. It says, Rejoice and be joyful, and be, it says, Rejoice and be joyful, daughter of Edom, who lives in the land of Uz. But the cup will pass to you as well, and you will become drunk and expose yourself. Now, I, I want to focus here. He says, Rejoice and be joyful, daughter of Edom, who lives in the land of Uz. Okay. Now, Job's name, it, it is interesting, his name, okay? If you look at his name, and what you know, what does it mean? Well, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and Job's name means persecuted. Now, there's a name. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not willing to name my son or my grandchildren, okay, or have anybody named Job, okay? And it's kind of interesting to me that I've never personally met, I personally, I mean, you know, Look, I, I, you know, in four decades of ministry, I have never personally met somebody by the name of Job or met anybody who knows anybody by the name of Job. Now, they, they may be out there. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't know anybody who's named by Job. And let me tell you, I don't recommend you name Job, okay? No, look, at this. it means, the name Job means to be persecuted, okay? It means to be afflicted. It means to be hated. It means to be treated as an enemy. Now, I have enough problems with the name Eddie, okay? I got a lot of people, I got a lot of people get mad at me and get angry at me, okay? Because I tend to be very forthright and very direct. You know, that doesn't mean that you have to be ugly and mean and all that kind of stuff, okay? But they just, they, they, they get upset at me, okay? And so, but I want you to understand something. I, I, that's what the name Job means. It means to be persecuted. It means to be afflicted. It means to be hated. It means to be, to be treated as an enemy. It has been strongly suggested that this name was given to Job after the horrific ordeal that he faced. That is very possible and not unusual. Okay? That, you know, other men had their names changed, okay, later in their lives. For example, Jacob's name was changed to what? To Israel, right? Saul's name was changed to Paul, and Simon's name was changed to Peter. So that's a possibility. I'm not going to discount it, okay? Um, uh, but that's a possibility, Okay? Their names were changed to fit their new responsibilities, or in Job's case, what he had survived. Now, I don't know if that's true. If that, if he would have had another name, we're not told what that was, okay? And we don't know this, okay? Here's what we do know. We do know this, okay? As we will see, we know that Satan treated Job as an enemy and did what he could to afflict Job to drive him, to drive him absolutely crazy, okay? His mission has not changed. Satan's mission has not changed till this day. You better wake up and smell the coffee. His mission has not changed. If he can do what he wanted by permission of God Almighty, okay, and God said, have you considered my servant Job who's a righteous, blameless man, okay? okay? Imagine what he will do with us. Listen to him. He continues to afflict God's people today, okay? He looks for his people to hurt, to destroy them, and uh, in fact, Peter warned us of this, right? Remember that? Peter warned us, the Apostle Peter. Let me show you. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter. Let's go. 1 Peter chapter 5, I believe it is. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at this with me and give me a moment. Drop down to verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Look at what he says. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's very clear. He hasn't, he, listen, he has not given up his mission. In fact, you know that word to, to devour, okay? It means to gulp down, gulp down, okay? Satan desires to do this to you. And as we continue, now, people laugh. They go, man, you know, brother, you know what you probably, you're just old and antiquated, you know? You're just outdated, you know? You, you, you speak funny. You, you talk about things that, we, let me tell you something. The word is eternal. It doesn't change. I don't care if you think I'm antiquated or you think the Word of God is antiquated. Let me tell you something. It, a, a, antiquity does not change truth. Just want you to say it. I just want you to understand that, okay? And as we continue through these verses, okay, 
we find out why, 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 why Satan hated Job and why God had exalted Job into a position where we can examine, where you and I, we can examine his trials and his responses. Why? Because they're important to us. Don't, don't make the mistake to take this book and say, well, Job is this antiquated book. It's just is full of myths and fables and is, is some kind of extraterrestrial uh, terrenal book. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. It speaks about powerful principles because you know what? You and I are human beings. And because we're human beings, you and I are going to face conflicts and trials and tribulations with other human beings. How do we respond to that situation or how do we react? It is preferable that we would respond and not react. And God wants us to study this man's life for a reason. He was truly a rare man and hard to find. He was a man of integrity. Can you imagine that? He was truly a rare and hard to find man, a man of integrity. And we still struggle today to truly find a rare man who's hard to find, who is a man of integrity. Notice his character traits and remember that these traits are God. This, uh, this is God's assessment of Job. This is not Eddie Eldefonso's assessment of Job. This is God's assessment of Job. He is the one that truly knows our hearts. So you, sh you, you and I should pay closer attention. Look, turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let me just extrapolate this verse. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, to highlight a point. <clears throat> In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, he says, But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. Because I, he says, he says, because I have rejected him. For God does not see a man, see as man sees. God does not see as man sees. Since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his heart. <clears throat> Listen. You can judge me if you want. That's just a short, old, fat, bald guy, you know, who's a little crazy. <clears throat> You don't know my heart. God knows my heart. I can't judge you on the outside. Yeah? But God knows your heart. Turn your Bible to Psalm 139. I just remember. Go to Psalm 139. I believe it's verse 1 or 2. Let me, let's go to Psalm 139. And look at this with me. In um, Look at verse 2. Psalm 139, verse 2. He says, You know... When I sit down and when I get up, you understand my thought from far away. You think God doesn't know us? You, you, you think that, you listen, I can deceive you, you can deceive me, we can deceive each other all day long, okay? But God knows when we sit down and when we get up, and, 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 he, and he understands our thoughts from far, far away. The prophet Jeremiah said it this way. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, he said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. I search the heart. I test the mind to give each person according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Now, I want you to understand some principles here. So go back to Job 1.1, 1, 1, okay? And I want you to see the reality of his principles. I want you to see the reality, the reality of his personal condition. The reality of Job's personal condition. He was perfect. He was blameless. In the old King James Version of the Bible, in Job 1.1, 1, 1, go back with me there, Job 1.1 1, 1 says it this way. He says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright. Perfect and upright. And the one that feared God and eschewed evil. In the New American Standard Version of the Bible, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. I just kind of, you know, I for about the first 18 years, <clears throat> approximately about 18 years, I preached out of the King James Version of the Bible. And then probably now the last 20 plus years now, I've been preaching out of uh, the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Okay? <clears throat> and look, let me, let, let me ask this question. But I still go back to a lot of the old James, King James phraseology because I, I like them, okay? I like them. They're a little more poetic, okay, if you will, okay? But, but they cut to the core. Look, let me ask this question. 
Does the fact that Job was perfect mean that he was sinless? Does the fact that Job was perfect, does it mean that he's sinless? I'm going to ask that question, okay? The answer would have to be no. Well, if he's perfect, why is he, why is he not sinless? No. So then what does the Lord mean when God said, Have you considered my servant Job? Okay? Have you considered him? He's blameless. He's perfect. I mean, that's what God said of Job. So what then what did the Lord mean when he said that? Okay? Well, the word perfect is the word tam in the Hebrew in the Hebrew tongue tam. Okay? And it means, listen to this very carefully, because it's really important to understand this, okay? <clears throat> It means that to, it, the word perfect, the way it's used here, or blameless, it means to be complete. It means one who lacks nothing in the physical strength. It means some, someone who lacks nothing in the physical strength or in the beauty. It's having moral integrity. It's having honesty. It's having um, honesty and purity. It's to be blameless without blemish. That's what that word perfect means there, or the word blameless there, okay? It means, okay, it, it means, okay, it's the word Hebrew tongue, tom, okay? Now, if you understand that, it was Job's passion, if I can put it in those terms. It was the passion of Job's heart to please God with his life. Is that your passion? Is it? Yeah. By being right with God, Job was right with himself. In other words, Job had in other words, Job had a clear conscience. Job had a clear conscience, okay? He was not going through life with guilt. Uh, uh, he wasn't going life through life with remorse. Um, he's not going through life with regret, okay? He was right with God, and he was right with men. He was the he was the passion. Okay, this was the passion of Paul. If you remember that, okay, uh, you remember that about Paul, the apostle Paul. Just hold your place there in Job one one. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter twenty four. And in the book of Acts chapter twenty four, go with me down to verse um, sixteen. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. He says, In view of this, I also do my best to maintain blameless conscience. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, I do my best to maintain a blameless conscience both before God and before other people always. Let me ask you. Is Let me ask you a question. Is everything right? Is everything right between you and God? Is everything right between you and other people? You and other men? Is it? Is your heart clean and pure before the Lord? Because the Apostle Paul can say that. Okay? Job can say that. But can we say that? And I want you to realize, realize that he can see it and he knows what's going on in your life. He, God, he can see absolutely. He knows, he sees everything. He knows what's going on in your life. And, and let me tell you something. May we please, I beg you, I implore you. May we endeavor to be perfect, complete, pure, and blameless before God and men. When people look at us, okay, may, listen, may they not have any cause to point their fingers and say, hmm, you wronged me. You're a fake. You're a liar. You're a hypocrite. You did not keep your word. Paul issued that same challenge in the book of Philippians, in the book of Philippians, okay? In fact, right now, in another course, I'm preaching through all, verse by verse, through all of the book of Philippians, okay? But I'm going to, let me draw your attention to Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. He says, so that you will prove yourself, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in this world. Isn't that a powerful? I mean, that's just absolutely powerful, okay? I want you to notice something else. I want you to notice about Job. Go back to Job 1 1. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> in Job 1 1, I want you to notice his relationship with others. I'm, I'm talking about Job's relationship with others. Let me show you this, okay? Look what he says in Job 1 1. He says, There was a man in the land in the there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, and now look at the next phrase, upright, upright. 
fearing God and turning away from evil. He was upright. Now, Job was upright. So let me. So we have to ask the natural question. What does this mean? He was upright. Now, the word is derived from the Hebrew word, okay? Yashach. Yashach. And, and, and which mean, it means, it means to be straight. It means to be level. It means to be correct. It means to be straightforward. It means to be righteous. Now, the, what this word is emphasizing, okay? Let me tell you what this word, in, in this context, okay? This word is emphasizing his relationship with other people. His relationship with other people. Job was straight. He was not bent. He was not crooked. He was. He treated people right. <clears throat> so when people think of your name, when people think about your name, okay, okay, what is the, what is their thought? You know, is he an upright man? Is that an upright woman? Is that a righteous man, a righteous woman? Hmm? Now, now remember, we're not talking about blank, we're not be talk, we're not talking about being perfect as in the way we use the word perfect on this earth among us among us mortal human beings. Okay, it, it needs to be complete, mature. Now, <clears throat> Job's honesty, okay, his honesty and, and straight and straightness brought blessings into life because people trusted him. And I, now, I admit, a lot of people get upset if you're very straightforward and honest with them. I understand that, okay? I, I do, I understand that, okay? And, and in fact, people tell me, you know, you know, Brother Eddie, he's just too direct and too firm. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you how it, how it is now. <clears throat> but one of the things that I've discovered as the years have gone by is that people who got mad at me because they said, well, you're just too straightforward in your answer and blah, blah, blah. But they come back to me and say, because I trust you. Okay. But you know what? But I'm no way. I can't even tie the shoelaces of Job or Paul, let alone Peter. <laughs> okay. But Job was a straightforward man. His honesty and straightness brought blessings into the life of of people, why? Because he, they trusted him. They trusted him. Okay, his actions pleased God, and they pleased other people that had to do business with him. That's the reason why you can't just go blow. By, you just can't blow by verse one, two, three, four, and five of Job chapter one, and just treat it as a list of oh, here's all his. He was a rich man. This is a bank account. No, no. Just think carefully about it. Stop reading the Bible too fast. Look, when a carpenter. Is looking for tools to build it. Okay, he looks for he looks for wood that is straight, right? That's what he's looking. For. You know, he's looking for the wood that is straight. That's what he wants to see. Is this? And and I remember, and I, I was a builder. Okay, and we look for it. Why? Because you don't want this is important. This is really crucial. Okay, he uses levels, right? Uh, he uses a, a compass. Uh, 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 he uses a protractor. At least that, you know, in my day, that's what we did. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and and you use plumb bobs, right, 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 that are straight in order to get accurate readings in, 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 in your measurements, right? That's what you have to do, right? Now, God is not any different. Did you want to say? God is not any different. Okay? He will use in a greater way a person that is upright, who's who is straight and true, than a person who is crooked, inconsistent, and unreliable. And unreliable. Let me ask you a question. A simple question. These are not profound questions. Are you straight? Or are you crooked? I mean, you're sitting there wondering, well, God's not using me. You better ask him some serious questions. What do you mean, God's not using you? You know, the psalmist had something to say about this. The psalmist pointing out, the, 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 the psalmist had pointed out um, the importance, the importance of an upright man and the blessings that result from be behaving this way, okay? Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 37, verse 37. Psalm 37, 37. Look at this with me. He says, observe the blameless person and look at the upright. Did you look at what he says. He says, observe the blameless person and look at the upright. For the person of peace will have a future. You're to look for people who are upright and blameless. You to look at their lives, their character, their walk, their integrity. And that look should translate into a powerful influence in your life and it should have a great impact in your life. 
and how you walk. Now, I can see that in a very dear, precious friend of mine, Dr. Gary Fleetwood. I can see that in his life. Listen. In Psalm chapter 25, it says this in verse 21. And in Psalm chapter 25, verse 21, it says this. Let integrity and uprightness protect me, for I wait for you. Let integrity upright and uprightness protect me. And he says, I for I wait for you. Listen, if you are a man of integrity and you're upright, okay, with others, okay, you can rest assured that that integrity, okay, that uprightness will protect you as you wait on the Lord. Okay? Look, <clears throat> now, you know, I live here in the country of Peru in South America, okay, I'm a full time missionary living down here, you know, and, um, there's just very few roads that I found that are straight or level. In fact, here is uh, you, you got issues when you travel. Hmm? But listen, like a level road, okay, an upright man, an upright man is calm and smooth. Okay, he exercises self-control, and he's gentle. He's gentle in his treatment of others. The fact that he is level, that the fact that that man is level indicates that he is balanced in his life. He knows when to be firm and he knows when to be gentle. He weighs all of the circumstances and all of his decisions carefully before implementing them. Like a straight road in which you can see far, far into the distance because it, it, it's not blocked by obstacles or it's not blocked by curves. The straight, listen, the straight person is out, is out in the open and easy to view. In other words, <clears throat> in other words, he is transparent and he's open. He's not a fake. He's not a hypocrite. His life is not concealed like sharp curves that may yield some unpleasant surprises like, okay, anything, around the corner or these bumps, okay, that can cause one to stumble. Stumbling blocks have been removed from his life. You can clearly see at a long distance and at closely his life. Let me tell you something. Doing what's right was a part of Job's character, period. It was a part of Job's character. Doing what's right was part of Job's character. Is it part of your character? Just do what is right because it's right. Doesn't matter who sees you, who doesn't see you, but God sees your character. Do what is right because it's right. That was Job. And that was his character, okay? He would not give up or quit in spite of the trauma he was experiencing. Let me tell you something. How many of you now, how many of us have gone through the traumas, okay, of Job? We can learn much from him and his character. Hmm? Hmm? Especially those folks who have quit serving the Lord. I, I see a lot of people. They just quit serving the Lord because they told me, well, you know, uh, the church didn't treat me right, you know, and, and the deacons didn't treat me right, and the elders didn't treat me right, and the, and the you know, and, and, the, and the pastor didn't treat me right, and the people didn't treat me right, and whoa, 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 was me, whoa, was me, whoa, was me, and they just quit serving the Lord. Would you please stop that nonsense? Get right with God. Get back on the straight and narrow. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. There's no such thing as a perfect church, at least the way we use the word perfect, okay? The way we use it, without any imperfections. That's not the way the, word, the Bible uses that word perfect, okay? I want you to understand this. We can learn much from him, especially those folks that have quit serving the Lord. And I know so many have quit serving the Lord. Why do, let me ask you this. Why do people quit doing that which is right today? Why? Why? Why do they do that? I guess there's several reasons why they do that, right? I dealt with enough pastors around the world, <clears throat> and I listened to them carefully. I'm listening to them real carefully. I'm listening, listening, and they're talking to me, and they're telling me why they're not going to do this anymore, and they're not going to do that anymore, and this and that. And, and I hear them, and I'm listening very carefully. And you know, and usually we're sitting there having a cup of coffee or, or, or a cup of tea. I'm listening to them, and 
and I, I'm, ama I'm amazed how many of them, and they're just spewing, they're just spewing, 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 and they're just venting their anger and going on, and I'm listening quiet, and, and, sometimes, I ask, and sometimes they'll say to me, you're too quiet, you're not saying anything, I say, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you. You know, and they'll go on and on. And they go, oh, you're too quiet. You know, I'm no, no, I'm just listening to you. I, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm processing what you're saying. Okay. Because I, I, I need to hear everything before I even begin to respond. Otherwise, because if I don't, I'm going to react, and it's not going to be pretty. Okay. But nevertheless, here's several reasons why people get, okay, why they just quit doing what is right. I mean, they just don't quit an institution. They just don't quit an organization. They just don't quit a church. They just stop doing right, period. And, and, they, wind up, and they take it out on the Lord because, you know, the preacher so-and-so and sister so-and-so weren't right. Hey, welcome to, this, welcome to this unjust world that we live in, okay? Listen, frustration. Frustration and being flustered, okay? With the, in a, and with the inability... To complete a task, they just don't have the inability to. They 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 have an inability to complete the task because they're frustrated and they're flustered. Okay, now they have capacity. They have capacity. They may have skills to complete the task, but they're so frustrated and they're so flustered. Okay, and now they develop this inability to complete the task because they've allowed frustration and flusteredness. Okay, to consume their heart, their mind, their feelings. Have you ever found yourself that way? Have you? Well, repent. And then there are others that just quit doing right because of friends. Yeah, friends. Op Let me tell you, friends' opinions can pressure us to quit or to discourage us. I mean, think about it. Job had these three amigos. He had these three friends. Let me tell you, with friends like that, he didn't need enemies. And all of us got people around us that are just like these three guys, okay? Hmm? These three stooges that surrounded uh, uh, of, uh, of Job, okay? Whose opinions are going to pressure you to quit and to discourage you. And they're just going to pile on and pile on. That's going to happen. And then there's others who just, you know what? You're just too busy being busy. You are. You have these filled schedules. Okay, you're just being too busy to get done what needs to be done because you're just being too busy to be too busy. And I see this, you know. You know, uh, my brother Gary, Doctor Fleetwood, says it this way. Yeah, I, 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 let me just paraphrase the way he says it. Okay, he has a much poetic way of saying it. But the problem is, is that a lot of us in ministry, we, we, we are c consumed, okay, and being eaten alive, being, being eaten alive by ministerial, par by, by ministry activity, by, by, by ministry parasites. You got all these things, they're just competing, chewing you, sucking you dry, okay, because you're just too busy being too busy. And then there are others who just quit doing things, right, because... There's just no more fun in this. The, 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 you know, I've lost the enjoyment. The fun and enjoyment is just missing. It's just not there anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. What do you mean you don't want to do this anymore? You no longer enjoy what you're doing. You just don't. You just stopped. Or the funds are gone. There's no more money. No more moolah. Welcome to the club. There's no money. I'm just going to quit doing everything. Don't do that. Be faithful and trust the Lord. Be faithful and trust the Lord to continue to provide one way or the other. Sources will dry up. New sources will be brought into your life. How, when, and where? I have no clue. I don't have to know the who, what, when, and where. I just have to know who, him. He's the one who makes the provisions available. How he does it, I have no clue. So we give up doing it, right? Because all of a sudden the funds are gone. It's amazing to me that, that, that we start to do it wrong. We start to do wrong even though the funds are gone. 
So we can't seem to do that. We can't do right, even though this funds are gone. You know, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense to me. Look. And then there are those who are who experience failure. Right? You know, it just sucks you dry. It zaps our enthusiasm. It's gone. Well, we, we're all going to fail one way or another. In fact, let me tell you something. Most of my ministry, I've learned how to fail well. And I could write a book on failure. Mm -hmm. But after every success of failure, okay, I have seen the Lord's merciful hand upon my life. And then there's this, and then there's this, um, uh, what would they call it? Um, this far-sightedness. This far, far-sightedness, okay? It, it's just absent. It's not there. You can't see the purpose of what you're doing. Or what you're doing. I, I, why am I doing this anymore? You've lost that perspective. And then finally, your faith is weak. It's weak. It's been beaten down. Do you know, I don't know anybody who's ever lived what Job lived. And he never, ever allowed this to take place in his life. What exactly is it that makes you so different and gives you the permission to quit doing what is 